A Decade of Mellow Death, The Orbit Culture Discography Ranking Introduction This is a somewhat unexpected video to be making, or at least it is that way for me, as I had forgotten that Orbit Culture was working on a new album until Descent showed up in my Spotify feed as a new release. But let's backtrack just a little bit. Truth be told, I don't rightfully remember what the origin of my awareness for Orbit Culture was, but I do have a very good guess. Back in late 2019 or early 2020, I joined a Facebook group, yes, I said Facebook, you may all take your moment to belly laugh for a moment, called Deathcore slash Metalcore Fans. That original group managed to garner some 90,000 plus members, heck, it might have even been more than that, I just don't remember, before it got zucked in the latter end of 2020. The admins soon after made a second iteration to replace the band group in December of that year, which I did of course join, and to this date it now has 170,000 members. At the time of writing, it's probably more now. Not too shabby, eh? But anyway, back to the point, it was in August of 2020 or so when the band's album Niha released. At this point in time, I had been working a fast food job, or I suppose more accurately, I was working at my old fast food job for the month in between school semesters. I remember seeing Buzz on that Facebook group about Niha's release, and so one day while I was at work decided to throw it on because I really liked the album art, and back then, I was all for discovering new artists to fall in love with. I mean, I still am, I guess, but not quite to the same degree these days. I'm not going to say I was disappointed, but I was certainly caught off guard, as Orbit Culture is far more of a melodic death metal or mellow death band than they are a metalcore or deathcore band. Sure, Mellow Death and 2000's Metalcore have a lot of similarities, but I went in thinking I'd get something more like the Deathcore I was used to by that point, such as Thy Art is Murder or Fit for an Autopsy. Obviously, the album was certainly not that. But despite this incongruence with my expectations and my tastes as they were back then, I've slowly grown more fond of certain Mellow Death artists, but Core is absolutely my main thing, I also couldn't say I disliked the record either. The cleans were a bit strange and would take some getting used to. Not every song was a banger, but what I did really enjoy, I enjoyed a lot for what it was. I promptly forgot the band existed, until earlier this year when I clicked on their profile in Spotify and realized, or rather learned, the band had released an EP called Shaman in 2021, which I listened to one morning getting ready for work, and subsequently enjoyed, but was far from a new favorite or anything like that. I then once again forgot the band existed until the aforementioned Descent showed up on my Spotify feed probably a couple weeks ago now at the time of this blog and video's release. Descent clicked with me in a way Nika and Shaman didn't on each respective first go around, and so I took the plunge and listened to all of Orbit Culture's discography. The following ranking is the result of that, given only one to three listens of each album or EP. Obviously, I'm a relative newcomer to much of the band's work, and my taste for them is defined by their 2020s material more so than before that. Several of these releases I listened to for the very first time over the weekend of August 18th, 2023, and this ranking is absolutely subject to change over time and more listens. In fact, several placements changed just over the course of writing this ranking. But I believe I've delayed this ranking long enough, so let's talk about the last decade of Orbit Culture. 7. In Medias Res, Album, 2014 I don't know exactly why this one didn't really click with me at all, but it was a pretty easy last place when it comes to Orbit Culture. In Medias Res seems to lean a little bit more on the death metal part of melodic death metal, and didn't really do much of anything that I found to be memorable or really worth checking out again. I listened to the album a second time to make sure it wasn't a fluke, but no, it's just not that great, which is unfortunate. The vocals were fairly one note, the instrumentals didn't really do a lot of the things that I've come to love this band for doing, and all the songs felt too short, a 3 or 4 minute average compared to the 5 plus minute average of nearly everything else they've done since definitely makes for less interesting and variant tracks as far as I'm concerned. And besides that, the album utilizes a few instrumental interlude-like tracks that just don't feel like they properly fit to me, despite being, strangely enough, arguably some of the best songs on the album. In Medias Res has very cool album artwork, but I don't particularly like much else about it. I don't think I dislike any of it, it just doesn't work the way the rest of Orbit Culture's discography does. Standout tracks, Calabalic, sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, 
for being one of the most broadly interesting tracks on the album, I guess, and Of Sovereignty. Probably the best track and the most interesting alongside Calabalic, despite the drawn-out fade-out ending, which I tend to dislike. 6. Odyssey, EP, 2013 Odyssey stands apart the most from the rest of Orbit Culture's discography because of the relatively low production, mostly on the vocals, but as a debut release, it is forgivable, not to mention understandable. There's a part of me that's a little sad the band hasn't continued to use the style of album art ever since the CP, but I do also love the style of Niha and Razin as well. But I digress. The production on the vocals may not be the best, and some of the mixing of the instrumentals is rough around the edges as a result of this being the band's first release, but I really liked what Odyssey was doing. The rhythms and patterns and the little intricacies Orbit Culture already thought to include to make it interesting and to make up for the vocal production was brilliant for a debut. Speaking of vocals, this EP and the sophomore effort Imidius Res are the only two releases from the band that don't have any clean vocals on them. Of course, this isn't inherently a bad thing, even if after getting so into their style of cleans, especially for choruses, visiting this for the first time had me really missing that element of the soundscape. Otherwise, there isn't a whole lot of complexity in the work, just little nods to it. The instrumental job is still very good, and I do see myself returning to this one now and again just for something different. I don't love the 2000s era of metalcore, or even that era of mellow death with the bands in the genre that I do follow such as Insomnium, but the things about those stylistic decisions that I do enjoy are things that Orbit Culture is calling back to and doing solidly with Odyssey. Plus, at just 20 minutes, none of these tracks waste time, nor do they ever feel too brief like many songs on In Midius Rest do, even though the opener, the plank distance, the second song, Wildfire, and the fourth track, Tell Us, were only three and a half, two and a half, and three minutes long, respectively. Overall, Odyssey is definitely good fun, and it introduces several of the band's overall strengths, the gallop patterns and riffs and drum grooves foremost among them, but it's not quite so mind-blowing as the band would eventually become. But you know what? That's perfectly acceptable, not to mention expected for a debut. It didn't place last in the ranking. That speaks for itself. Standout tracks, the plank distance, for the guitar work which is phenomenal, offsetting the roughness of the vocal production, Odyssey, because I love the patterns and grooves in the guitars and drums, and The Sparrow. What can I say, I'm a sucker for epic songs. 5. Rosin. Album, 2016. My apologies ahead of time, but I cannot come up with an answer as to which language the title of this record comes from, and therefore how to pronounce it, so my butchering of it will just have to suffice. That is, unless the title is just a play on words for the figure on the artwork kind of looking like a raisin, but something tells me that isn't the case. Rosin, released in 2016, which I'm definitely not in denial about being seven years ago, was the first Orbit Culture album to include clean vocals, and I must say that it was a very welcome addition to the formula, particularly after I found the previous album, In Medias Res, underwhelming and even somewhat boring. Rosin also features the band beginning to approach more lengthy tracks in songwriting with an epic scope to them, as all the tracks in Medias Res were relatively shorter in comparison, although Odyssey did have a few of those tendencies too in one or two tracks. There are fantastic riffs and drum grooves featured throughout, an aspect to the band's musicality that I absolutely love. Their grooves are infectious, especially their galloping riffs, requiring nearly constant headbanging to satisfy, also a quality that would remain fairly constant through the remainder of their career thus far. These kinds of riffs make frequent appearance in Descent, Niha, and Shaman, giving you a taste of just what this band is going to be about in their future. But Rossin also has some rather interesting decisions that make songs like Son of All just kind of feel off somehow, and riffs like the first one in the title track feel comparatively empty until they're joined by almost excessive ambiance. The chorus of Obsession is a notable example of a bold musical choice that is interesting and memorable but doesn't quite jive perfectly. However, while several of the Stranger decisions appear on Rosin's first half, the back half doesn't really suffer from this, and the last few tracks in particular are fantastic. The Haste to the Fire is a wonderful change of pace that really reminds me of my favorite parts of Insomnium, right before Wings of Dragon and Eye the Wolf, which do a good job of retaining the identity of the album as a whole without the slight strangeness of before. And then the last three tracks, however, are where the album truly shines. They foreshadow the sheer quality of what the band would come to do in its future, whether it be the epic and grand scope of the soundscape from the umbilical chord, the heavier musicality of Dawn of Light, or the simultaneously filthy yet feelsy moments of In War, 
Orbit Culture really knows how to evoke mental imagery like nothing else in this portion of the album, more so than most of the rest of their discography. Rosin overall isn't quite to the level of what the band has done in the 2020s, unless the explicitly mellow death side of their sound is preferable to you, but it's a very solid blueprint for it all. The back half in particular is quite good, with a final few tracks that are just incredible quality that competes with the best tracks on Nicha and Descent to Come. It almost feels wrong to have this one so low, but what can you do when a band has so many releases of such high quality? Standout tracks? The Haste to the Pyre reminds me of what I love most about Mellow Death as a genre. The Umbilical Chord has the sheer epic nature to the back half that I love. And In War for being relentless but not overpowering, tastefully conveying aggression without making one feel aggressive. 4. Red Fog, EP 2018 Red Fog is notable simply for the fact that one of the band's most popular songs, or at least one of their most comparatively streamed songs, Saw, is on it. Or, well, the song was still in their top 5 on Spotify before Descent came out, and has since changed. But with that in mind, I was shocked by how little I remembered of this album the first time around, both in terms of what I listened to and in terms of how I felt about it. At least with In Medias Res, I remembered not liking it much, and in the case of, well, most everything else Orbit Culture has put out, I remembered really enjoying myself, or having at least a track or two that stood out to me, but Red Fog just didn't. Luckily, that changed a little bit on my deeper second attempt, hence why this now ranks above Odyssey, when that wasn't initially the case. I perhaps put more time and effort into these rankings than I should. Substantially improved production and sonic clarity found here over their first two releases, and even a little bit compared to Rosin, really makes this a good go-to compared to Odyssey. Red Fog in general, however, for me is notable after my second go-around because of how different it is from the rest of the band's work, despite still having the core identity that makes Orbit Culture the band that they are. A track like the title track has some relatively strange vocal melody decisions, much like Rosin before it, but also hints at the aggressive breakdowns that the band would come to occasionally use to great effect later, and a song like See Through Me has the fantastic Feels or Reels vibes that a handful of the band's later tracks would go for as well, a vibe that the newborn one would do again just two tracks later. I'm trying to determine if these are actually the best examples of such musicality that the band has done, and they're definitely up there. Then Saw has moments of absolute brilliance throughout, proving that the band really knew what they were doing, thus explaining how they managed to create Niha next, further confirmed by the final track, Way of the Masses, which is an absolute powerhouse behemoth. One of the things I'm most into though with Red Fog from a foundational perspective is just that it really takes the song length to the next level, a decision that would entirely level up Orbit Culture's songwriting as a whole. The average song length on this EP is right about 6 minutes compared to the 4 or 4.5-ish average of previous releases. With all that being said, I do think the thing that strikes me so much about Red Fog now as I'm discussing it as a whole is how on my first listen nothing about it stuck out to me as particularly mind-blowing, though it didn't stick out as bad either. It just seemed like nothing horribly or incredibly special. After my second go-around, it went from number 6 in the ranking to this spot in number 4. I'm incredibly surprised by this fact, but definitely very glad that I came back to it so that it could prove me wrong. Standout tracks? See Through Me. Feels are reels, all day, every day. Fantastic melodies in this one. And Way of the Masses. One of the band's best constantly heavy tracks prior to Descent's breakneck pacing. 3. Descent. Album. 2023. Descent is arguably what woke me up to Orbit Culture after simply enjoying their two previous releases the first time I heard them, and I'm quite glad it did. I think this band may be my favorite Melodith band, even if they fall a bit on the heavier side of things than, say, Insomnium, one of the few other Melodith bands I've ever found myself getting really into. This record has some amazing songs on it and is generally a very solid work of tense and engaging musicality with high quality production and vocals that truly satisfy. Forgive the track by track I'm going to give on this one, but as it's brand new and I didn't feel it warranted an entire review on its own besides the ranking, I decided this would be appropriate. Although Descending as an opener feels a little out of place and doesn't quite flow into the first song the way that I wish it did, it does set the dark, brooding, and intense mood that the album largely falls into throughout its runtime. But when Black Mountain, the first full track of the album, does come around, it is brilliant. It's honestly one of the band's best songs, starting the album off with a breakneck pace that remains consistent through a majority of it, doing some really fun instrumental things that just require a stank face reaction. 
portions of the track are what I've had running through my head since I just listened to the album again. I'm surprised this one wasn't a single, although maybe it'll just be another North Star of Niha situation where it becomes the most popular song on the record, or one of them, in spite of its non-single status. The next couple tracks, Sorrower and From the Inside, continue this bar of very high quality. The album is truly defined by these opening 20 minutes. Sorrower is a bit of a simpler track in that it's primarily got the classic heavier mellow death sound to it. From the Inside is the better of the album's two singles and slows things down a tad bit for a bit more deliberate pace while keeping it intense, allowing for the vocals to take center stage, particularly for a classic yet fresh orbit culture chorus. On that point, classic yet fresh orbit culture is an apt descriptor for Descent as a whole. It continues the evolution of the band's sound that they have developed through the 2020s, making something that is very orbit culture, undoubtedly so, but also something that differentiates itself just enough to be new. The next track, the first single on the album, is potentially one of the least exciting for me compared to the first three, a due in no small part to its more get in, get out nature and its four and a half minute track length compared to the five and a half to six and a half minutes of the songs before. It does do a great job in the midsection to set it apart from the band's typical song structure, with its greatest strength being the fake out quasi ending that opens for a tension building phase that could have simply faded out at about three minutes, but instead is used to climb to a decent climax. What really surprises me is that Vultures of North was the first single they chose to go with, though it has obviously been successful, garnering already 3 million streams on Spotify alone, when the following track Alienated exists. Granted, on both listens through the album, the barely over 3 minute length of Alienated made it by far the track I recalled the least of inherently, but every time I replay it, it genuinely stands out. It has a fun time with the basic verse and chorus structure, continually finding ways to build up and release energy repeatedly without ever letting up the pace. Then comes the next couple of tracks, which are actually quite unique for the band, relatively speaking of course. Isle of Fire is another slower and more methodically paced track in the instrumentals, making way for what is an especially uniquely constructed chorus experience, which then moves into Undercity, which itself continues the slight shift in the album's sound to something ever so slightly new-ish. Except this time, it's a somewhat more beat-by-beat -beat track for half of it, with a somewhat core sound for the other half, as it features a very brief breakdown right in the middle, followed by a more brightly toned instrumental portion that eventually becomes a solo underneath some great screams, followed by a breakdownified version of the main riff to close the song, releasing the tension built throughout this bridge into the final chorus. And finally, to continue the trend of this slight degradation to a somewhat more core-influenced sound, Descent, the title track, once again returns to the truly breakneck pace that defined the first few tracks of the record, going out with one final bang before the reprieve and the closer. Furthermore, this song's bridge and breakdown is easily the closest the band comes to being deathcore in their history, I think, barring only the very end of the second track, To Shaman, which is an epic song, by the way. Descent gives the listener an idea of what Orbit Culture's sound would be more like if they had decided to lean more death core, hell, metalcore too, it doesn't matter, rather than mellow death when they formed. Finally comes the closer, Through Time, which is a much, much slower song, one that can finally be considered an overall soft song. It's much more introspective than anything else on the record, and the most introspective and vulnerable they've been since those two closing tracks plus the outro of Niha. It turns out being a great way to ease the listener out of the experience that was this absolute wall of noise for the majority of the record. Overall, Descent is an incredibly worthy entry into the band's repertoire, taking a solid placing in their top three works and continuing the grand and epic legacy that I hope to follow and hear more of going into their second decade and beyond. Standout tracks, Black Mountain. Fantastic opener, breakneck pace, all around fun, one of my favorites. From the inside, great single, Evolves formula just enough. And Descent. Edges on core more than normal. Absolutely killer pace. 2. Shaman. EP 2021. The only reason I think this one doesn't take the number one spot is because it's only 25 minutes and easily could have gotten away with another one to two tracks. Ironic, considering the Niha Deluxe Edition bonus tracks with only minor reworking could have easily been included on here, instead of tagged on the end of a perfect album. But I digress, and tip my hand while I'm at it. The sound evolution following Niha is very good, intentionally designed to be just similar enough, but also enough of an evolution to be a bit more fun to play live. And there are several moments in these five tracks that prove that to be correct. It's just a super memorable and enjoyable experience, especially when you look at it as a deeper evolution into and flirtation with core. 
Some of the band's heaviest moments and some of their most infectious cleans are in here simultaneously, split between an incredible breakdown in nearly every track, most notably in Flight of the Fireflies and Strangler, and their continually incredible style of choruses, plus an insane solo also in Strangler, and all of it combines to make Shaman a very easy album to listen to if you have a quick half hour while getting ready for work or something. A Sailor's Tale is probably the most unique track of the five songs on Shaman, and it's such a great journey every time. It's one of the band's longest songs in general, but it uses that runtime so appropriately. It's a great closer for Shaman, rivaling only the closing of Niha, her top spot in Orbit Culture's discography, and still fits on it perfectly despite being slightly different from the rest of it. But touching back on the Niha Deluxe Edition bonus tracks once again, I do think that stylistically they could have very well fit on this EP to turn it into a full album. As Shaman is the most metalcore release Orbit Culture has put out, and the reason I love those bonus tracks comes down to making the core kid in me smile, and not so much as being great additions to Niha, so it really is ever so slightly a shame that they weren't included here when they were released with Niha in early 2021, and this EP came out just 8 months later anyway. As is though, Shaman is still an incredibly worthy entry into the band's repertoire and solidifies Orbit Culture as a metal powerhouse of the decade. Standout tracks? Strangler, for an epic breakdown plus an epic solo? Hell yeah. A Sailor's Tale, an entire album condensed to a 7 minute track, goes through all the waves of epicness. 1. Niha, album, 2020, with a deluxe edition from 2021. Honestly, the brilliance of this album is immense. I would say I don't really know what else to say, but that was only until I did a second listen and took notes, where I immediately discovered there was a lot to say. Nearly 800 words of simple notes, in fact. I could do an entire album review on Niha as well as Descent with that kind of material, but I don't want to waste your time like that. I will instead talk about several standout moments and design decisions Orbit Culture made here with examples from several of the tracks. Niha is a pretty heavy album. I would argue it might even be a little heavier than The Scent, which itself definitely wasn't soft. Additionally, Niha is a bit darker in tone than most of the rest of Orbit Culture's work, at least in memory, though I admit it may just be the sheer quality of the album that makes that aspect stand out so much to me, and notably touches on some darker themes and topics with the lyrics compared to past work. That is, at least simply from what I could tell without looking up the lyrics, although maybe it's just because the vocals are conveyed so brilliantly and blended with the music just so that I was naturally compelled to listen closer anyway. But beyond just being heavy, I also love the way that Orbit Culture introduces and blends in very technical moments on Niha. Starting off with a bang and at the front heading into the, sort of, title track, North Star of Niha, this introduction to the body as a whole stands on its own as a testament to what Orbit Culture can achieve between the melodic and heavy, between the face pounding and catchy, between the simple and complex. Niha furthermore does a brilliant job blending in the unconventionality that the band likes to throw into their song structure now and again, and how they like to enhance the entire product with a broad and interesting soundscape, especially well showcased in tracks like Day of the Cloud and Behold and again later with the last few tracks, rendering a very epic and open conclusion to the record that is astounding. More on that in a bit. Day of the Cloud also showcases some decisions that it shares especially with Behold, beyond just an interesting soundscape, Melody. Yes, even more than being a decently dark and heavy album for a good portion of it, the melodic elements and ambiance of Niha is splendid. The ambiance especially, which the band would perfect somehow even more by the time Descent came around. The vocals always complement every aspect of the music too, regardless of if it's a driving riff with relentless drums, oh man the drums on this album are so good, or the occasional insomnium style slowdown and melodious moments, occasionally including strings in the mix, a wonderful inclusion to the band's formula continued with Shaman and Descent, and occasionally used on previous records as well. Kudos to the band for combining their talents so well here. Finally, I want to shout out a couple final pieces of the Orbit Culture puzzle featured on Niha that I loved so much. First, breakdowns. Orbit Culture is not a deathcore or metalcore band, but I love the way they still utilize several breakdown-like sections within their music. Sometimes it's the classic Melodeth style like in Day of the Cloud, and somewhat now and again in Open Eye, not to mention countless other tracks throughout the band's discography, but other tracks also utilize even better breakdowns that are some of my favorite moments when they happen, such as in Mirror Slave, which actually also features the rare guitar solo immediately afterward, and Nensha, perhaps the most notable of them all. 
I'm telling you, Mellow Death and Metalcore are a lot more similar than they are not, no matter what elitists want to say. Lastly, finally, I want to end this by talking about the last three tracks. Rebirth, The Shadowing, and Set Us Free. Rebirth begins as yet another slower, more melodic, and feelsy song, a vibe that I love the band doing because they tend to do it when it is sure to be the most potent. It's the most broadly unique track that makes for a surprising choice as a single, with a super fun structure that eventually leads into an emotional height with a beat-down style pattern to contrast with the emotional moments, another strength of the band, and throughout everything remains quite tormenting lyrically. All of this amounts to a final line close to the end that leaves the tension tight, only somewhat releasing itself in part, leaving a lack of resolution that melds into the shadowing brilliantly. The shadowing takes this unresolved threat and absolutely runs with it, truly. Making another surprising single choice, its incredibly pained clean vocal styles that don't appear anywhere else on this record join perfectly with the instrumentals, just as usual, to create something so genuinely special it's hard to put into words. To add a layer, Orbit Culture also incorporates several orchestral-esque moments in the chorus with specific drumming patterns to make a very grand and epic song, a sound they'd prove their mastery of in Descent. Continuing the strong lyrical meaning from Rebirth, the song knows just when to take both the vocals and the instrumentals to melodic and acoustic moments, no matter how brief, to punctuate that tension, a word I've used way too much in this ranking, and emotion to accent the aforementioned grand and epic nature of it all. It just builds and builds and builds into a perfect closer. Set Us Free as that closer, an instrumental piece meant to ease the listener out of what they just experienced, is a relatively simple song, nothing horribly noteworthy. It flows well, even if I would have somewhat preferred its track length to have been attached to the shadowing instead. It also made me wonder if the album as a whole is a concept album. I need to give it one more final listen here soon with the lyrics pulled up to determine if I think it's a concept album or not, but if you happen to know more, shout it out to me below. If a younger me was into this kind of music, I could see these last few songs on Niha being all-time favorites for me. Standout tracks? North Star of Niha, one of the band's best songs, super well balanced. Day of the Cloud goes through just about everything the band does best in one really epic song, Rebirth, The Shadowing, and Set Us Free. The entirety of this list as the closer is just a powerful and impactful listen. Conclusion Orbit Culture may not have my favorite discography of every band out there, but with this exploration I've made as of recent, they've definitely solidified themselves as a favorite of mine, a band that I'll see in my recurring rotation quite frequently, especially alongside older favorites of mine like Trivium and Slipknot, whom I haven't spent near enough time listening to the last few years. There may be some relative missteps that don't shine quite as bright, but everything this band has done in the 2020s is really solid, and I absolutely recommend it if you somehow have watched or read this far into the video or blog without having given yourself that experience. I'm surprised to come to this point and realize how close my ranking is to the release order of everything as well. But either way, Nika especially is a must listen at the very least, as I mentioned before. It might very well be perfect as far as I'm concerned. The standard edition is at least. It is no surprise that this band shot out of obscurity with the release of that record, and just as I mentioned before, it honestly might have suddenly shot the band up into an all-time favorite position of mine, barring nostalgia.